everyone, and welcome again to Race Academy episode six. Today we have uh, a number of people uh, joining us, and I'm going to run through and welcome everyone we have today. Just while the last few people are logging on now, as usual, we're going to run through and say hello to our clinicians and others from the USA, everyone from the USA, New Zealand. We've got a lot of people in from New Zealand, Malaysia. Singapore, welcome to everyone in Singapore, Australia, our largest continent, and a number of people in from the United Kingdom. So welcome to everyone from the UK. We love the guys from the UK. So today we have a very special guest speaker today and the first guest speaker for our Race Academy program. I'd like to talk you through with Dr. Jeff Hall. Dr. Jeff Hall is a specialist orthodontist and has been for over 30 years. And Jeff and I, I, I had the pleasure of meeting Jeff uh, over 10 years ago when he decided to digitise his front end of his um, orthodontic practice in Melbourne uh, when he installed his first digital intraoral scanner. Uh, and I was impressed to see one of the very first uh, orthodontists to digitise the front end. And it goes to show you what Jeff's about, how he practices uh, and his, his drive and thirst to to bring technology and take advantage of the technology that today uh, that today's technology can, can provide us. Uh, he's really been a pioneer of modern day orthodontics uh, and education. Uh, he's been very involved uh, in the education. He's the very first person to bring Invisalign uh, to Australia and I believe was the first person to take uh, Invisalign, the first person out of the US to, to do Invisalign. So his experience uh, has really taken off from early early days. Um, he's co-founded the Dental Ed and Ortho Ed facility, and you'll hear a little bit about that today. If you do get the chance to to jump on board with the Ortho Ed Institute, uh, and you'll see how 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 streamlined Jeff's approach in uh, in educating the the general practitioners to to align malaligned occlusion and to treat um, people from children all the way through to adults. Um, he did bring the Seattle Study Club to Australia, um, which has been extremely popular, and he's been part of the, the teaching staff at the University of Melbourne and the University of Pennsylvania, I believe. So he's uh, a wealth of knowledge uh, in and across the globe. So today he's decided to come and join us um, to give us a bit of a, a, some insight regarding early orthodontic treatment. Um, he's going to give us some of the essential knowledge for the general practitioner today. So I'll, I'll take no further ado. And ladies and gentlemen, please welcome and, uh, and make welcome Dr. Jeff Hall. Thank you very much, Matt. Thank you for your very kind introduction. And I must say, it really is a bit of a privilege and an honour to be lecturing for a company like yourself that I've been involved with you know, in different ways for the last 10 years. And yeah, for somebody like yourself to talk about myself and innovation, I take that as a big honour coming from you guys who are exceptionally innovative in the whole dental field. So I thank you very much for your very kind introduction. So I'm only going to really touch the surface today on early orthodontic treatment and hopefully provide you with some of the essential knowledge that I feel you need as a general dental practitioner. So Matt's already given, given you a little bit of a brief rundown about myself and I really do have a passion for teaching uh, general dentists with founding the Seattle Study Club, et cetera, et cetera, and the Ortho Ed Institute. But I did my undergraduate training back in 1983 at Melbourne University, and I did orthodontics at the University of Pennsylvania and graduated top of my class in 1990. And trust me, I say that with no arrogance whatsoever, because I haven't told you that when I finished general dentistry at Melbourne University, I probably came 49th out of 50. And the point that I'm trying to make at is that anyone can be an orthodontist, okay? In fact, you don't have to be bright. This whole idea and this whole concept that orthodontics is so difficult, it's so incorrect. You know, once you understand the principles, everything else is easy. And I'm living proof of it. I was no great genius as a dentist and just about everybody out there would have been a better dentist than myself. And I just learned the principles and that's what I'm gonna try and bring to you today is some of these principles. So I've been a specialist orthodontist for over 30 years and I've treated over 10,000 patients myself. So hopefully that gives me a little credibility. So this is probably one of the most important slides because you see so much that goes on in this early orthodontic arena. 
And every time we treat a patient or we decide, should this patient have early orthodontic treatment, you've got to ask yourself this question. Early orthodontic treatment is designed to prevent interferences with a normally developing occlusion and correct problems in a developing malocclusion. And that sort of come, goes without saying, everybody understands that. But what people don't understand is that this early phase of treatment should reduce the severity of the malocclusion significantly with the possibility of even eliminating it. In other words, there's no point in doing some early treatment on an eight or nine year old if you're still gonna to need to do the same second phase of treatment with two years of braces, et cetera, et cetera. So every time you decide to intervene on a young child, or say somewhere between the age of eight to 11, you've got to ask yourself the question, is this early phase of treatment, will this reduce the severity of the malocclusion significantly with the possibility of eliminating it? If you can't answer yes to that question, you shouldn't be doing an early phase of treatment for that patient. So, so the question is to the patient and to the parents, why do you provide orthodontic treatment early? And if you do that for the correct patient, and I say, and I really emphasize the word, the correct patient, because early treatment is not for every child that comes in. But in my practice, probably 25% of children do require and benefit from early orthodontic treatment. And by providing this early orthodontic treatment for the correct patient, in many cases, that's going to reduce the need for extractions in the future, hopefully reduce the severity of the malocclusion, allowing an easier and shorter orthodontic approach once they come into the permanent dentition. Most of the time, we definitely want to correct functional problems because if they are left untreated, they could cause TMD issues and even require orthognathic surgery in the future. And obviously we want to help to improve the final aesthetic outcome. And some people would argue we want to improve the patient's airways and we do it for psychosocial reasons to improve the child's social and self-confidence. And they're really important reasons that you would need to explain to the parents, why are you doing this early treatment for that child? So I have a lot of different areas that we would use early orthodontic treatment for. I'm not going to go through all of those today, obviously, but a patient who has a class two functional problem, class three functional problem, severe anterior open bite, patients who have cross bites with associated functional shifts, patients who have severe crowding that may require a serial extraction approach, kids who have a moderate crowding that where we can utilize that leeway space that we were taught at university or what I prefer to call the e-space. And in general, the indications for this early orthodontic treatment is to correct functional problems, correct developmental problems. And once again, I reiterate to significantly reduce the severity of the malocclusion. So I'm gonna, this is so important one has to keep remembering every time they decide they're going to do an early phase of treatment, they've got to say, is this going to reduce the severity of the malocclusion significantly with the possibility of eliminating it? If you can't answer yes to that question, you shouldn't be doing early treatment. So in this webinar, I'm basically going to address just two common issues that I believe require early orthodontic treatment. And that's the management of functional orthodontic issues in the growing child and management of the class two malocclusion in the growing child. So they're the two topics that I'm going to discuss in this webinar. So let's talk about functional issues. So this is what we would call a functional problem. So when the, when the child bites together, they would bite normally in any, into an edge to edge situation the mandible slides forward into an anterior cross bite. And the problem with this functional situation is we're gonna get excessive growth of the mandible over time. We're gonna get a traumatic occlusion of those lower anterior teeth, pushing of these lower incisors further forwards, detrimentally affecting the bone and the gingival, and the gingival condition. So anytime we see an anterior functional shift like this one, 
we need to correct it. Now, some people could correct it with using a URA, an upper removable appliance. There'll be no problems with that whatsoever. There are caveats on that, and that will determine, be determined by the position of the roots. But let's assume that we're just gonna move the crowns forward. We could do this just with a simple URA, which we all got taught at university. However, we also want to retract these lower anterior teeth slightly because they've been pushed forwards a little bit. So we can do this very simply with some partial fixed appliances that any general dentist would be able to do. You put some partial braces on, and if you remember back in the university days, if we used a URA, we would need to incorporate some posterior bite blocks in there to relieve the anterior occlusion, to allow these anterior teeth to move forward. We can do this very simply with some posterior composite. So we basically mimic what we would have done with our acrylic posterior bite blocks. So we put some partial braces on, on the upper anterior teeth. We could also add some to the lower anterior teeth to move those back. And basically in a period of about 12, 15 months, we can go from there on the left-hand side to a situation where we move the anterior teeth forwards, got extra space for those upper lateral sizes because they would not have fitted in in their existing appearance. And now we've gone from this situation here with the anterior crossbite into a nice class one, good overbite, good overjet. And we just let this patient sit there. We've relieved the functional problem. And now the, now the jaws can grow in a normal fashion. But we also see these functional problems in the transverse dimension as well. Very common where we see a posterior crossbite occurring. And 99% of the time, whenever we see a posterior crossbite, we usually have a midline discrepancy because there's been a lateral functional shift. Very rare to see a posterior crossbite without a midline discrepancy. So in other words, when you've got this lateral functional shift, in centric relation, when we get them back into their rest position, the midlines are actually coincident and the mandible is then forced to slide to one side to achieve a comfortable position or what we call maximum intercuspation. So these problems, even though you see it as a unilateral crossbite, the problem and the cause of the problem is actually bilateral in nature. So when you have a unilateral crossbite, but it's bilateral in nature, we have to do bilateral expansion. So one type of appliance that used to be used very frequently was what we call a quad helix appliance. The other appliance which I like to use routinely is a RME or an RP, stands for Rapid Maxillary Expander or Rapid Palatal Expansion Appliance. And how it works is you basically submit bands on and this appliance has a little um, screw mechanism and once a day, mum or dad will turn the key and voila, after about six weeks, the maxilla has widened and the way you're gonna know that it's widened properly is you're gonna see a diastema open. This is why I like the palatal expansion appliance like this, because I actually see the diastema opening, which shows me that I've actually got expansion and of the mid palatal suture, which is what we're trying to achieve. Whereas with the quad helix appliance that I showed you before, I tend to find that there's more tipping that occurs and not as much skeletal expansion. Now this could be very useful if you were dealing with a seven year old or a very young child. But when you start talking about nine, 10, 11, 12 year old, I think the treatment of choice is more of this uh, RPE, rapid palatal expansion appliance. So mum and dad will turn the key once a day and after about six weeks, the jaw, the maxilla is widened, the diastema will close up on its own, but I leave this in place for probably another six months at least to allow time for the bone to form in that mid palatal suture. So to give you some, an idea of how useful this appliance is, because it does a lot of things. So this girl comes in and we've got a narrow maxillary arch, very poor aesthetic smile as a result. But most importantly, she has a crossbite. 
and she's got a lack of space for the anterior teeth. So we put in our palatal expansion appliance first because one of our golden rules is we always correct the transverse first. So no matter what the problem is, we always look at correcting the transverse first. So we put in our RPE, and this is what it looks like. And, and here's the little hole there. Once a day, mum or dad will turn the key. And so what usually happens is we do one turn per day, which is about a quarter of a millimetre. And as I said before, it usually takes about six weeks of active expansion. But I always see the patient after three weeks just to make sure that the diastema is opening. If I, I must see a midline diastema to confirm that the palatal expansion is occurring. If I don't see a midline diastema, it means we're, that we're just getting tipping of the teeth and not skeletal expansion. So that is the most critical part of what I want to see when the patient comes in in three weeks' time. So I want to see, obviously it won't be that large, but I want to see some diastema opening or else I get very concerned. So how much do I expand? That's always a very common question. And I like to expand it from the point of view of the palatal cusp of the upper just to hit the buccal cusp of the lower. So in other words, I want to overexpand because you will get some relapse back because you've got some tipping movement occurring and the teeth will always want to go back to where the roots are. So you always want to overcorrect. So here we are after we've done our palatal expansion, and that's about three months of palatal expansion. And then I go ahead and put some brackets on. This is a very typical early phase of treatment with an RPE. It's an RPE for usually about three months, and then we put some partial braces on to align the teeth. So what I've really done now is not only have I corrected the functional problem, which is a crossbite, but I've actually given a better arch width, which is gonna give a much more aesthetic smile, and there are some people that would say, now that I've expanded the arch, I've improved the airway as well. Now, I'm not totally convinced that we're going to improve the airway significantly, but I can say you're definitely not going to make it worse. You can only have a positive effect on it. So usually this first phase of treatment in my practice is about 12 months. I want to get in and out within 12 months in all of my early phase of treatment because otherwise the patients burn out. So this is what it looks like after 12 months of phase one treatment, and we just let them sit and wait. I've done nothing on the lower arch because they're gonna require a second phase of treatment later. So this girl comes in, and I think everybody would agree, she has a functional problem. She's got an anterior open bite, right posterior cross bite. And as I said, the first thing you're gonna always do is resolve the transverse discrepancy. So we put our RPE in, and we go back here. Once again, you're gonna see a midline discrepancy. So we put the RPE in, and, and I incorporated in there a tongue guard and a thumb guard, because there was a bit of a tongue thrust as well, and the kid was also a bit of a thumb sucker. So I, I incorporated this thumb guard as part of the appliance, and we've gone ahead and expanded, corrected the cross bite, added our partial braces, as I showed you before. And in 12 months of treatment, I've been able to correct the anterior open bite. I've been able to expand the upper arch, correct the posterior cross bite as well, and given her a much more pleasing aesthetic smile at the same time. So that was all done in 12 months with a first phase of therapy. And if you can start doing that in your early children, you're going to have raving fans, not just not the children, but the parents. And who do you think refers you all these patients? The parents at school, the mothers, etc. It can build up your practice enormously. So another child who comes in with a severe anterior open bite, severe functional problem, and once again, a posterior cross bite. So what are we going to do? We're going to go ahead and expand the upper arch because we always correct the transverse first and some partial upper braces. And then we just let nature take its course. Now, nature takes its course may not be as kind as we'd like. 
So whenever we do a first phase of treatment like that, we have to explain to the, to the parent and to the patient that they will require a second phase of treatment. So even though, this, even though we did all of our expansion, we still had to take out some teeth for this patient. And so afterwards we took out four premolar teeth and we ended up with a very nice result. So even though we did our palatal expansion and look at the improvement in the arch form by doing so. So if you look at it from here, look at how much the arch forms improved. So you don't have to, when you see the facial photographs, you wouldn't be able to tell me that that patient had dental extractions done. So you can't say just because we've extracted teeth, we've destroyed the profile. That is a myth that is out there. And I can show you hundreds of cases where the profile is still perfect with extractions being performed. But that's, that's a story for, no, for another day. So just to show you what can be done with a early phase of treatment using palatal expansion and some partial fixed braces. That could be routine in any dental practice. So the second part of this webinar is how do we manage the class two malocclusion, which is probably the most common malocclusion that presents to us in a growing child, in the Caucasian population. So this is a flow chart of how do we treat the class two malocclusion and we've got, and we treat them differently whether they're a non-growing patient like an adult or a growing patient. And we're going to keep on this side where we're going to discuss the growing patient. So this girl comes in with a class two malocclusion and she has a moderate overjet because most class twos have an overjet. So the question is, do we treat that patient or don't we? Is this a functional malocclusion? Is it going to get worse? Are we going to reduce the severity of the problem significantly? So what we do know is that if we treat these children at an early age, whilst they are growing, we can use these type of appliances, which we call growth modification appliances. So everybody remembers the old headgear. And don't get me wrong, the headgear is a fantastic appliance. The problem is nobody wears them. So we don't use them very often. But as a true orthopedic appliance to change the way the bones are, this is a great appliance. But nobody, very few people use it today because our, the children won't wear it. So we're now into this area of functional appliances. So let's talk about different functional appliances because in principle, they all do the same thing. This is the binator, and all they do is they move the jaw, the mandible forwards, and the theory behind it, and I tell you it's theoretical, is you move the condyle forwards out of the fossa, and the theory is the condyle is the growth center of the jaw. So I explained to the parents, if this is a little bit like doing muscle building exercises, that you're gonna move the condyle forwards, you're stretching the muscles, and now the bone's going to form. So as we stretch the muscle, the bone's gonna form, the jaw grows, and then we finish off afterwards with putting braces on to lock in the occlusion. So the theory is, and this is how we all got taught, that we're gonna grow the mandible, et cetera, et cetera. That's what the theory was. So this girl comes in with a class two, division two, or division one malocclusion, moderate overjet, deep overbite. Back then we used a binator to move the jaw forwards. And our theory was to stimulate mandibular development. And then we went ahead and finished off with fixed braces. Really important that we finish with fixed braces because if we don't, we don't lock in the occlusion well enough. And there is a tendency for the condyle to change position. So very, it is important that when you're using these functional appliances that we do finish with our fixed appliances and we get a beautiful result. That once again, if we can get a patient from there to there, we've done a pretty good job. So in my practice, I, I love these fixed, I love these fixed herbs appliances, okay? I'm an orthodontist. The only reason I use this fixed herbst appliance is because it's active 24 hours a day and I, and I don't want it to be in the patient's hands. 
and we get predictable results. But I'm gonna give the general dentist out there who are listening to this, what I believe is the better option for a general practitioner. But what you have to understand is the teeth do not know what appliance is in place. They can't tell me if it's a binator, if it's a herbs, if it's a twin block that we're gonna discuss. All they do is respond to a force system. So the, the appliance of choice that you're going to do is irrelevant. The teeth are only the teeth and jaws are going to respond to a force system. So we're going to put a force, whatever appliance we use, to move the lower jaw forwards. Now the fallacy is we don't just get growth of that lower jaw. So let's be very open and honest. What are we going to get when we use a functional appliance? Let's say we have a 10 millimeter overjet. You, and we go from a 10 millimeter to a two millimeter overjet. We correct the problem by eight millimeters. That's not eight millimeters of mandibular growth. We might get two millimeters of mandibular growth. We might get two millimeters of the lower incisors tipping forwards. We might get two millimeters of holding back the growth of the upper jaw, because normally when the jaws grow, the upper jaw grows downwards and forwards, and so too does the lower jaw. So it has a reciprocal side effect of holding back the growth of the upper jaw, and it also tips back the upper teeth a little bit as well. So out of that eight millimetres of correction, let's say, you'll get two millimetres with mandibular growth, two millimetres with the lower incisors coming forwards, two millimetres of holding back the upper jaw growth, and two millimetres of tipping the upper incisors back. So in other words, it's not just skeletal mandibular growth, it is dental alveolar correction. And I really don't care because all I, all I care about is I want a class two malocclusion to go to a class one and treat it as a class one. So here's the herbst appliance, moves the lower jaw forwards. It's going to show the same thing. Theoretically, it grows that lower jaw, but it doesn't. It will move, it'll grow the lower jaw a little bit. It'll push the lower teeth forwards. It'll bring the upper jaw back and the upper teeth back. And then once and once you get to a class one position, then we're going to go ahead and put braces on. So this is going back to the year 2000. This kid comes in and back then we didn't have these appliances. And this kid was seen by four other orthodontists who all said orthognathic surgery to move that jaw forwards. So I thought, well, now we've got that herbs appliance. Let's put that in. So this is a class two, full class two. We put the herbs appliance in, which is what it looks like. The jaws move all the way forwards. And this is finished off in a lovely class one situation. So we've gone from a beautiful class, or we've gone from a class two, finished off in a class one situation by using that herbs appliance for 12 months, followed by our fixed braces for, 12, for 18 months. So, but if we have a look at the profile, we don't have a perfect chin because we haven't got just pure mandibular growth. But at the end of the day, if that was your child, wouldn't you want to go from here to here and avoid surgery? And then there are some people out there who's going to say, but Jeff, I don't like his chin. And I'm going to say, that's fine. If you want the chin fixed, we can now do a very simple advancement genioplasty at any time in the future, rather than what we would call an osteotomy, which then can affect the nerves and blood vessels and we've got the risk of paresthesia, you know, serious surgery. Whereas an advancement genioplasty, very simple, if that is a concern of the patient at any time in the rest of their life. And that's what we explain to them. So this girl comes in and we've got some crowding of the upper and lower teeth and you can see the protrusion of the teeth. And we can see we've got a class two situation. This is a functional problem. If this was left untreated, they would either need extractions in the upper arch or more than likely surgery when they were older, just like the other patient, the same thing. So we went ahead and we did a functional appliance for them first. And look at the difference. We've done a functional appliance and followed by braces. And any dentist out there could do the same thing. Very nice result. Because all I've done with a functional appliance is, gone, is taken them from a class two to a class one, and then the orthodontic treatment is absolutely easy. So Charlie comes in 
And Charlie's, yeah, you can see it in his profile. Severe class two, div one. He's been teased at school. Class two, div one. And what's very simple, what we do in most of these cases, we're going to start off with palatal expansion first, as we're going to see later. And because whenever we do a functional appliance, we're going to bring the mandible forwards. And what we're doing is bringing the wider part of the mandible forwards. And by because we bring the wider part forwards, we have to expand the maxilla to allow the maxilla to house that wider part of the mandible. So this is after we've done the herbst appliance, we've brought the jaw forward, so we've taken a class two, a, cl a full class two into a class one position, and then we just finish it off with braces. And I've probably got about a thousand of these cases I can show you over time. And they're all the same. It gets boring after a while. And then we go ahead and finish off with fixed braces. So we finished off with braces on the upper and the lower teeth. And look at the difference in the alignment and the bite. But his chin is still not perfect because we haven't got 100% mandibular growth. But what, but what I've done is I've corrected the class two to a class one and then finished them off as a class one. And I think everybody would be happy if that was their child and, the, and we avoided one extractions and we avoided orthognathic surgery. So big, nice improvement. But nobody's going to say that's a perfect chin position. So for those of you out there going, oh, I don't want to use the Herbst appliance, we actually do have now Herbst appliances which are bondable, which make it a lot easier. But if I was a general dentist today, so that's a bondable herbst appliance. So that actually makes it very simple compared to our traditional one where we had to fit, fit stainless steel crowns on. So that is also available today. But if I was a general dentist today and I didn't want to use the herbst appliance, I would be using a removable twin block appliance. That's the easiest functional appliance for a general dentist to use. And the twin block is exactly what it says. There are two pieces of acrylic, one on the upper jaw, one on the lower. And when they bite forwards, they have to bite into that forward position. And the upper arch, there will be a little jack screw in there because we need to expand the upper arch, like I was saying before. So this is what the Herbst appliance looks like. So when they bite together, they can't bite normally. They've got, they slide on this inclined plane and they move the jaw forwards. And then as part of what you're going to do as an adjustment, you're going to reduce the amount of acrylic on the posterior teeth to allow these posterior teeth to erupt and get a locked in occlusion once they achieve the class one position. So the twin block, it looks exactly the same from a functional point of view as the bi as the binator or the herbs. Why? Because the teeth don't know the difference. So with the twin block in, you're basically going to, you can't bite together on these pieces of acrylic. You're now going to move your, the jaw forwards. And as you move the jaw forwards, you end up with the condyle moving out of the fossa and once again, theoretically stimulating mandibular growth. But as we now know, not only are you going to stimulate mandibular growth, you're going to move the lower incisors forwards a little bit. You're going to have a reciprocal effect on the maxilla where the upper teeth are going to move back a little bit and where your and the upper jaw is going to be retarded in its normal forwards and downwards growth. And we're going to go from a class two to a class one, and then we're going to put our braces on and lock in the occlusion. And that should be very standard. The advantages of the twin block is the is basically they have the occlusal inclined planes and gives a lot of freedom of movement in both lateral and anterior excursion. And it can be cemented in the mouth if you really need to. So, so if you've got a child who's not cooperative with wearing it, this could be something that could be done. And like I said before, the one advantage of the twin block to me is that it has that compensatory jack screw so you can actually expand the upper arches at the same time because that's essential with any functional appliance that's going to bring the mandible forwards into from a class two to a class one. 
So the ideal prerequisites for using a twin block, class two division one, usually with a retroanatic mandible. I wouldn't be using a functional appliance unless there was at least six millimeters of overjet. Because remember the first slide, or one of the first slides I showed you in this webinar, we've got to reduce the severity of the malocclusion significantly. So for example, if you only had a three millimeter overjet, I could fix that up with just normal braces and elastics. So why would I want to put the patient through another 12, 15 months of a functional appliance? So that's where the whole point comes in. Am I going to reduce the severity of the malocclusion significantly with the possibility of even eliminating it? So to me, I would use a functional appliance only if the overjet was greater than six millimetres. Minimal crowding. I want a, a decent arch form and I want a proper torque on the mandibular and maxillary incisors as well. And the ideal age to start this is around about the age of 10 to 11, about two to three years before their pubertal growth spurt, because we need growth on our side. And ideally, you don't want to use this in open bite cases. They're much better treated with deep bite cases and a normal airway. So in summary, the twin block, which is what I would say is the, would be the gold standard or the treatment of choice for a child requiring, requiring a functional appliance for in the hands of a general practitioner. They're simple, they're comfortable, and they're fairly aesthetic. You, but the patient has to wear them 22 hours a day. So they wear them all the time ex except for eating and cleaning. They're very versatile. And the one thing I like, why I like that compared to other removable functional appliances is that we can incorporate the palatal expansion part of the treatment in it. So let's finish off with a case that we did a twin block for. So PD comes in and we have a retrusive lower jaw. You can see the class two division one malocclusion. This has to be bread, bread and butter of what happens in your practice. I'm sure that you would see just about 40% of children that would come into your practice would have this type of malocclusion. So this is a VTO, virtual treatment objective. And by that, all we've done is we've got the kid to move their jaw forwards because they're a class two. So we've got them, we said, just move your jaw forward. And we show that to mum and mum goes, wow, look how much better it'd be. And that is already how you sell the functional clients. This is the type of position that we want to provide with your daughter. So this is after the twin block, 12 months of twin block therapy and see how it's opened the bite. So that's why I say to you, these functional appliances are very good in deep bite cases. They're not great in open bite cases. Yes, we can modify the design, but in general, let's keep them to deep bite cases. And at this particular point, we wait till the permanent teeth come through. We go ahead and put braces on the upper and the lower teeth. So we put braces on. And in fact, if I did something wrong here, I should have waited a little bit longer before I put the braces on because this child is now going to be in braces a little bit longer than they should be because we're waiting for other teeth to come through. So after 18 months of braces, we've got a beautiful result. So 18 months of braces with 12 months of our functional appliance or our twin block. And we have a bond and retainer in place, which is routine in our practice and routine in what I teach. And this is post retention. So looking pretty good. And this is four years after retention. So the only thing that would have happened is probably the bite has deepened a little bit, but the correct, but the class two is absolutely perfect or the correction of the class two is absolutely perfect. So four years post retention, look at the profile, looks pretty nice. Lovely aesthetic smile, all achieved because we started them whilst they were in that growth phase with a functional appliance. No genius from me at all. You put in an appliance and it basically works. So all it is is choosing the right patient and putting the appliance in. Once we've gone from a class two to a class one, life is very simple. 
And here we are showing the improvement in the profile. And you know, would I say she's got a perfect profile? No, but this is what we call growth. This is what we call growth, but it's still very, very, very acceptable. What I can say to you is she's got a beautiful smile and a really lovely occlusal scheme. And that's what our job is. So when we, our, our, that, that was our VTO that we did by just having the child move their jaw forward and that's what we actually achieved. So we're fairly close. So this is just a really brief rundown on our, on some of the very things that you would see in your general practice, what I'm going to call the essentials in early treatment, which is basically functional problems, whether it be a class two functional problem, whether it be a anterior functional shift or a lateral shift and how you can resolve it. So this is just a real taster for you. If you're really interested in more in the way of early treatment, which we're actually doing an online and live stream course in September, September 10th, 11th and 12th. And we're going to go through a whole gamut of stuff in early treatment. Yeah, What appliances, how to manage spacing cases, how to manage crowding cases, management of impacted teeth, transverse problems, vertical problems. We're going to go into a lot more detail of the class two, the class three, malocclusion, how to fabricate, place appliances. And one of the big problems I think a lot of people have is how to integrate this early treatment into a general practice. Yeah, how do you charge for it? How, how do you explain it to patients? How do you give the informed consent? Because it can really kill you if you don't know what you're doing. And obviously, we're hands-on session as well. But just to finish up, you know, Matt really, really introduced us in a lovely way. We do run a whole two-year mini master's program. So our early treatment module is just one module out of nine modules that we do in our ortho ed two-year program. So if you're really interested in learning the whole gamut of orthodontics from early treatment all the way through, all the way through to um, adult treatment, including liner therapy, look, some, um, then the mini masters may be something you could be interested in. A lot of our dentists who have taken our course and doing our course, we've asked them, why do you do, why did you join? And basically they talked about the idea of increase knowledge to re and reduce the risk of bad outcomes. And I think there's a big part today to stay competitive with your colleagues and they want to do more orthodontics in their general practice. It's a, it's a growing area. And at the end of the day, you want to increase your patient loyalty and start reducing the referrals out. I mean, you guys don't refer out upper central incisor or endos. So why would you want to refer out early treatment cases like we've just been talking about? And at the end of the day, you want to boost production. So we've had all these people give us testimonials. You can have a look at our website. What do you get? There are nine modules. We do 23 days of face-to-face -face training over two years. We also have online modules as well. So some of, so for you guys who are overseas and can't come, there will be online modules available if you want to do that. And we do offer an opportunity to receive a postgraduate diploma. And it is run over two years in various cities. So I won't go through all the modules, but you can go to our website and have a look at all the, different, all the different modules that we do, but it covers the entire gamut of orthodontics, obviously from diagnosis, treatment planning, which is the core, all the way through to interdisciplinary therapy. Now, how to set up implant cases, how, how to work with your surgeon in surgical cases, early treatment, and I think everybody's getting involved in aligners, et cetera. So just some testimonials from just two. We've got about 40 different testimonials which have been very, very nice. But basically, they're the reasons that most people want to undertake a mini master's degree in orthodontics. And if you sign up early, we actually offer about $10,000 worth of early bird specials for the first 30 people that attend. So if you want to find out more, you go into orthotraining.com.au and you register your interest. I'm happy to spend 45 minutes with anyone who just wants to have a discovery call and just so we can just discuss your individual requirements and goals. And if you want to book a time for that, 
no obligation. Go to orthotraining.com.au forward slash session. And hopefully in the next week, there's going to be a special offer with race as well. So for all you guys, so um, that may make it even even more more of an incentive for you guys who are part of the, the race group. So that special offer should be coming in the next week. Okay. So on that note, I think I finished just on time for Matt. Um, I want to thank you for your time. And I hope that you got something out of it. I know it was quick. And we just we really just touched the surface of early orthodontic treatment. But at least it gives you a little bit of a taste as to what can be done in your practice. So thank you very much. Matt, I'll open it up for some questions. Yeah, thank you, Jeff. We do have a couple of questions. Um, we've got one coming from Amid Clyde saying, how do you retain mandible position between twin block therapy and fixed braces? Okay, that's a really good question, Eamon. Um, and that comes, down to, that comes down to timing of treatment. And that's one of the reasons why I like to do it about the age of 10 or 11, because I want to go straight from that twin block therapy into my fixed braces. So I don't start them when they're eight or nine, because I think you spend too much time holding them. I want to start them when they're about 10 and a half, 11, and then 12 months worth of twin block therapy and then straight into the braces. So the braces act like the retainer at the same time. And this comes down to what we were talking about. How do you integrate this type of treatment into your practice without killing you? Because if you've got this holding pattern for two years, you're going to be making all these other retainers, et cetera. So to me, it's actually that type of thing is just one phase of therapy straight from the functional clients for three years, let's say, till we finish them. Thank you, Jeff. I, uh, I think that summed it up. I have another question in from Nok An Juan. In terms of skeletal maxillary expansion, is it okay to use removable RPE as opposed to the fixed RPE that you have shown us in your lecture? If not, why is the removable RPE not as effective, even though the treatment time would be the same, particularly after active treatment during retention phase for six months. I understand that the RPE will cause tipping of the teeth, but as the removable RPE also rests on the palate, I assume that it would also cause skeletal expansion also. Uh, the, the, that's probably a longer conversation than just the question. All right. Okay. Um, in orthodontics, there, there, there's a theory, there, we call it, orthopedic movement and orthodontic movement, okay? So orthopedic movement is high levels of force for a short period of time. So because you need a high level of force to cause what we call undermining resorption to occur, which allows the bone to actually move for skeletal expansion. And so, for example, a headgear is a high level of force for a short period of time, hence a skeletal effect on the maxilla. And an RPE works in exactly the same way. It's a high level of force done just once you've done the turning, hence causing maxillary expansion, skeletal expansion. The problem with a removable appliance is that you can't get the, high, the highest level of force because if you did that, the appliance would keep falling out all the time. So you tend to get more of an orthodontic or a tipping force occurring. So that's where the problem lies in. And to me, unless you see that midline diastema opening up, and it's been documented in the, in the literature, that that's the key. Now, I've never seen a midline diastema open up with a removable expansion appliance. Now, it may happen when the kid's five or six and the bone's really, really soft, but it won't happen when they're nine, 10 or 11, which is the average age that you'd be doing the treatment. So I'm not saying it's wrong but at all, but in my hands, I would always use... If I want skeletal expansion, I want, I'd use an RPE. Now, if you're talking about how much do you get, you get for, with, an, with an RPE, which is banded, it's two-thirds skeletal, one-third dental. When you're talking about a removable expander, you're probably looking at about one-sixth one sixth only of skeletal expansion. The other five-sixths is dental expansion. That's what the literature would tell us. Thank you, Jeff. I have one last question. Do we have time for one more? Yeah, of course we have. Um, it says, on average, what is the usual relapse in millimetres for an RPE case? And is it related to the patient's age or speed of treatment? 
Um, I can't give you an average, an average amount. Um, it's definitely related to the patient's age. Um, the speed of treatment really doesn't vary with an RPE. You're still going to do the one turn a day for six weeks because that probably gives you about 40, that probably gives you about 40 turns and each turn is about a quarter of a millimetre. So with that one RPE screw, the, what they call the pitch of it, it's about 10 millimetres. Okay. Now the reason, but what we do do, remember, is we overexpand. So the powdery cusp of the upper are just touching the buckle cusp of the lower. So we want to overexpand. Okay. So that would probably be, I'd say, four or five millimeters of relapse. But most of that relapse, I believe, is the tipping of the teeth, because teeth always want to move back to where the roots are. So if you tip the if you tip the crowns out buckly, the teeth are going to want to move back to where the roots are. So I'm not going to say whether that's relapse or whether that's just what I call crown upright. But I think if you over overcorrect, you're going to be far better off always. Okay, look, thanks, Jeff. Um, I, I want to encourage everyone to go to the OrthoEd website, or Institute website, and have a look at what Jeff's offering. Um, he does take a very comprehensive yet simplified approach to addressing these issues. So by all means, take, uh, take him up on that and, and see if you'd like to sign up there. Uh, alternatively, if you want some information on your appliances, feel free to call the Race Dental and talk to our technicians in our creative orthodontic department for any information or further information required on the appliances. But look, um, even my wife was watching today, um, Jeff, <laughs> and, and I've, I've just got a text from her saying, this orthodontist is awesome. So well, there's some feedback from the layman uh, who's watching too, mate. Uh, she's not Thank you very much, man. But she's very smart. Look, and if you have any other questions, by all means, um, make contact with myself, Matt, at racedental.com.au. And I'm sure Jeffrey's open to uh, any questions, but please feel free to make contact with the Ortho at Institute. Uh, he'd love to have a part of it. And I'd like to thank you again, Jeff. For your comp if that's the tip of the iceberg, uh, I'd love for these dentists to come and join you at the Institute. Thank you for your time and your knowledge. Um, feel free to, to tune in in the next couple of weeks for the next Race Academy episode. But until then, guys, stay safe, and we'll speak to you all soon. Matt, thank you very much for your time. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. All right.